My name is Chelsea, um, and today I'll be reading Daniel 1, verses 3 to 14. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring the, to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and the other normal families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking men, he said. Make sure they are all well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language of, and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azur Azariah were, <laughs> were four of the young men chosen from all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Az Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of, he, he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid my lord, the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine, if you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make the decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and test them for 10 days. Thank you, Chelsea. Bonus points for all those names. <laughs> I know most of you wouldn't have wanted to have to deal with those names. Thank you, Chelsea. Hey, before we dive in and, and take a look at what we can learn from Daniel this morning in our new series called Uncompromising, I do want to offer your prayers to God. Just a few moments ago, we wrote down on our cards those things that we're struggling with, those griefs, those hardships, those difficulties, but we also offered our gratitudes as well, and so I want to do that collectively together, so would you join me? Father God, it is no easy thing to come into this space and open our hearts and look at and listen to those places where we are tender, where we are struggling, where we are waiting, where we are hoping. And yet that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to give voice to our places of pain in your presence. We're just collectively asking for all that these cards represent for you to hear our hearts cry and to meet us in the places of our deepest needs. We offer these prayers as a gift before you and we ask you to receive them as we intend them. We thank you that you are a good God, that you do hear our prayers and that you are well on the way towards helping us in those places of deep pain. In the meantime, I ask that you would help us not so fixate and focus on our troubles that we can't see what's right in front of us, which is the gift of today and all that comes with it. There is so many things that even before we got out of the door of our houses this morning that we could give thanks for. For more than enough for all of the resources, for closets full of clothes and pantries full of food, for vehicles to get us here, for life and health in our bodies, for a community to worship with. We could go on, but we just give you thanks. We give you thanks for a nice sunny day, a nice warm day. We give you thanks for changing seasons and new opportunities. We lift our prayers to you, and we say please, and we say thank you. In Christ we pray. 
Amen. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you live in occupied Ukraine. Sometime since the invasion that occurred on fe in February of 2022, I want you to just for a moment stop and think about what life might be like if you lived in Kharkiv or Kiev or Mariupol. I want you to think about since the Russian invasion, what life might be like for you. Now, I don't say this for you to focus morbidly on something that is difficult for you to uh, imagine, but I, I want you to put yourself in a place, you'll see why in just a few moments. Or maybe, maybe it's Gaza. Maybe you live in Gaza, in the Golan Heights or in the Gaza Strip, sometime since October of 2023, with the onslaught of the Israeli bombings, I want you to imagine what it would be like to live in this space. Imagine the things that you've seen. The devastation that you have experienced. The rubble, which is now your home. Houses, businesses, schools, hospitals, Nothing but a heaping ruin of rubble. The pure evil that you've witnessed, the subsequent emotions that you've felt. And then I want to ask you a simple question. How do you ever recover from something like this? Do you ever recover from something like this? How do you, how do you move forward? Life was different once upon a time, but now it's hard to get those memories of what life used to be like. Now it's what life is like, and it is difficult to comprehend. I ask you these questions because that's where we begin today in our series with Daniel. Armies are on the march, nations are at war, devastation and destruction have been left in their wake and deep losses will change the lives of the residents of the southern kingdom of Judah forever. In 587 B.C., the Babylonian armies laid siege to Jerusalem, tearing down its walls, destroying its homes, businesses, and even the religious center of their personal world, the temple. Destroying the temple, removing its treasures, and carrying into captivity some 20,000 residents therein, including the king, King Jehoiakim, his family, royal officials, army officers, and skilled craftsmen, leaving behind only the poorest of the poor, the most destitute, those people who had nothing to offer the Babylonian king. Over the next six weeks, we will follow the events of the Babylonian invasion and subsequent exile and focus in on the life of one young man in particular by the name of Daniel, who has much to teach us. Chelsea, how old are you? That's about how old Daniel was when we find him in this story. 14, 15, 16 years old. As the story opens, Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar orders his chief of staff to select the best and the brightest of the captives so that he can run them through a three-year indoctrination program into sort of the Babylonian way of thinking and living and being. In that group are four teens by the name of Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Now, before Jerusalem was leveled, these four uh, were being groomed for very important duties and work. They were part of the royal family. They had a bright future in front of them. Yet in a matter of moments, their world would be turned upside down and inside out, not unlike the residents of Gaza or those in Ukraine. They would never again see their families. They would never again return home. Never again would they worship in the temple, which was so central to their life and faith. And for a time, they would even lose access to the Holy Scriptures, 
which in many ways had served as sort of a lifeline for them for living and being and becoming who God had intended them to be. Yet amid all of the devastation, each of the four young men committed themselves to making the very best that they possibly could out of a difficult and horrible situation. During their indoctrination program, the king's intent was to ultimately give them a totally different identity. He wanted to change them, who they were and what they were all about. He wanted to actually even, to, to boot, give them new names. Daniel would become Belteshazzar, Hananiah would be Shadrach, Mishael would be Meshach, and Azariah would be Abednego. Imagine for a moment as warring armies come into and destroy all that you have known as your home and cart you off some 800 plus miles into a foreign land where you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you don't know the history, you don't know anything, and now you are being conscripted to become part of the king's court, part of the king's staff, because you are among the best and the brightest, which used to be a gift, but now it's a curse. Now you are becoming part of the king's new plan. That's what would happen when warring armies would go into uh, lands and take them over. They would take the best and the brightest and they would indoctrinate them so that they could have the best of all of the places that they were capturing. It makes all the sense in the world. And so these four young men are now in a space where they are being conscripted into the program that uh, Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar wants them to be a part of. Their names have been changed. And now all of these new uh, regulations are being sort of thrust upon him. And Daniel is sort of trying to process through all the things that have come upon him so quickly. And there's this space where he's like, all right, my life has been irrevocably changed. I've been carted off to this new land in Babylon. Okay, I can deal. I've been put in a three-year indoctrination program. Okay, I can deal. Um, they've given me a new name. I can deal. I'm learning a new language. I can deal. Okay, fine, sure, no problem. But then there comes this point at which Daniel seemingly is offered something that most people would jump at the opportunity to have. It says in verse 8 that Daniel was offered the best and the most delicious of the foods and the wines that the king had to offer. And you would think, amidst all of the other hardships that I've gone through, something good to eat and something good to drink would be good. But that isn't what verse 8 says. It says that Daniel said, okay, 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 not okay. At some point, I'm going to draw a line where my convictions stand, and I'm not going to cross that line because this matters too much to me. It says in verse 8, he was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them because the food and wine given them had been sacrificially offered first before they were served it to the Babylonian gods. And according to the Jewish law, to partake of it would have been to participate in idolatry, which is really what the people believed got them there in the first place. So he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat the food. He says to him, at some point, I can take all of these things you've thrown at me, but I, I draw the line here, and I will not eat this food. It also says, as the story goes along, that Daniel somehow, some way, had gained favor with the chief of staff. And so he appeals, based on the relationship they had formed, for him not to make him eat the food. But unfortunately, the chief of staff is worried he says, verse 9 says, Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. He had given him favor. But in response to this suggestion, he said, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. Because if you become pale and thin 
compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid that the king will have me beheaded. He's like, I love you, Daniel. I respect you. I appreciate all that I've learned from you in this very short period of time. You have shown me quite a bit. But if I give you an open door here and then your health starts to go backwards, it's not only your neck, it's mine too. I can't do it. And so then Daniel says, let me see if I can appeal to your higher nature. I have an idea. So please, if you would consider just a 10-day test period we will drink nothing but water and eat nothing but veggies. And afterwards, you can see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. And then you can make a decision in light of what you see. And the attendant agreed to Daniel's offer and tested them for 10 days. Now, if you look closely at the proposition that Daniel has for the attendant and the chief of staff, you will notice something. Now, you may need to go back and look at this because if you're not paying attention, it'll pass you by. But I'll just give it to you. I want you to go back later maybe and look at it and unpack it. What I notice about Daniel's proposal, what I see is that it is very possible to hold to deep convictions without being rude or demeaning to those that you disagree with. More than the case that Daniel is making is how he is making it, how he is speaking to the attendant. In his proposal, he is looking for a win-win scenario. He's respectful with someone who sees things totally differently than he does. By the way, did you know that it is absolutely impossible to win someone over and at the very same time be disrespectful to them? Did you know that? I think this is something that's been lost largely on us these days. Daniel teaches us how to have conviction without becoming a jerk. It's a skill that I think in these days of great division among us that would be very important for each of us to learn. Daniel is like, I know your neck's on the line and I know my neck's on the line, but I've just hit this space where I cannot do this. And so I would appreciate it if you just give me a small window of opportunity to show you something that you won't even imagine as possible until you see it. And if, if it fails, then I'm willing to relent. But if it doesn't, then I want you to know that the God that I serve is more powerful than the ones that you serve. So... Let's give it a test drive. Let's take it for a run. Now, I don't remember the last time you got in a disagreement with somebody that you uh, saw something differently from and how you conducted yourself in the middle of that disagreement. But I think what Daniel teaches us here as a young man, 14, 15, 16 years old, is that you can believe strongly in something without trying to convert them by concussion over that thing you believe. It used to be in our politics that those who were vying for office would do this with one another, mudsling. But now it's not just our politicians, it's us. It's the sides we take, it's the things we believe that has us at some point acting like fools. Believe what you believe, hold the convictions that you hold, but do so without becoming a jerk. Because once you change the nature of your character, nobody hears what you're saying in the first place. How is it possible that you can win me over with all of the negativity and the criticism and the shouting and the blaming and the con condemning? It's impossible to win somebody over and act like a fool. And so Daniel says, listen, I have a proposal Let's try it this way. If it doesn't work, I'm willing to try it your way. What do you think? And how did it turn out? Chelsea didn't read this part, but I want to read it to you. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier 
and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. And so after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Things worked out well for Daniel. Daniel had the favor of God upon him because he had basic convictions that he would not cross. But what I think is significant here is not only did he have the favor of God, he had the favor of his enemies. He had the favor of those who were opposed to his life and his way of being. He had the favor of those who had captured him and dragged him some 800 miles into captivity and conscripted him, conscripted him into a program of indoctrination where he was literally trying to change everything about the way Daniel thought and lived. Daniel had favor with God, but he also had favor with his opposition and enemies. We all want favor, but what if favor comes at a cost? What if, what if favor follows faith? What if favor follows integrity? What if favor follows one's willingness to risk your core convictions for the sake of losing even your neck? What if favor follows humility? What if favor follows gentility? What if favor follows respect? I don't know. Think about it for a moment. Who are those people that you are drawn to and who are those people that you're repelled by? Who are those people that even when you see them and understand where they're coming from and even though they hold a different perspective or think differently, have a different way of looking at the world, you still have favor for them because of the way that they conduct themselves. Do you know anybody like that? Most of the time these days when we differ from one another, we draw hard lines of division and we try to separate ourselves from their company as much as possible because we haven't yet learned how to have conviction without acting like a jerk. But what if we could learn how to have conviction about things that matter to us and at the same time be humble and gentle and respectful? What if we didn't have to convince the other side that we're right and they're wrong? What if we could just live according to our convictions and be the kind of person who found favor not only with their God, but with their enemy? Because of who we are, because of how we live. As we're getting started on the front end of this new series, there are several things that we need to learn from this young man, Daniel. But I think the first thing that we need to learn is it's okay to have conviction. But hold those convictions with humility and gentility and respect. Honor people who even see things differently than you. Honor people regardless of how they come at you. Do you think that Daniel was always treated well in the king's court? No. He was trying to be reprogrammed. The king was trying to change every aspect of his being what he ate, what he drank, where he lived, how he spoke. But Daniel said, there's some things that I'm going to accept and there are just some things I'm going to draw a hard line. And I'm not going to cross that line and whatever it costs me, it costs me. But I will not defile myself by eating those things and drinking those things. I don't know what your core convictions are and maybe you need to just think through that because there's a difference between opinions and convictions. Everybody's got an opinion about something. 
Opinions are something that we hold. Convictions are something that hold us. And I don't know what core convictions you have, but once you identify what those are, it's important for you to not cross that line lest you become somebody other than you are, lest you become a lesser version of who you believe God made you to be. But then once you hold fast to those convictions, you can hold fast to those convictions and still be a decent human being, still be a kind man, a respectful woman. You can still be a good person and believe differently from others in your personal world. You can still get along with others even when they see things differently. You don't have to be a jerk. And I think that's an important thing. And I think it's lost on us these days, by and large. Because once I discover that you just don't agree with me or see things the way that I do, then I make judgments about you. I fill in the blanks about who I think you are rather than give you the chance to show me that. Families have been destroyed. Friendships have been destroyed. For what? Because you voted differently? Because you thought differently? Because you couldn't possibly tolerate that another human being would do something different, think something different, be something different than you? What if earning God's favor isn't enough? What if, what if we're being challenged by Daniel to earn the favor of our enemies? That's another thing altogether. And so I think as we sort of wrap up this morning, I want you to be thinking about a couple things getting started. I want you to think about what are my core convictions and what are just basically opinions. They're different. I can have an opinion about something without that something being like steadfast, something that I hold to and something that I need and something that I won't violate. What are my core convictions? Let me establish those so that I can live rightly in a world where maybe the culture runs against those said values and convictions. And what am I willing to do to count the cost to make sure that I do not violate those convictions? And then, secondly, I want you to think about how it is that you deal with people who are different than you, who think differently than you, who in many ways disagree with a variety of different things that you may have opinions about or even convictions on. And what are you willing to do to move in the direction in your character, humility, gentility, respect, to gain favor with even those who would be your enemies? Do you care? Does it matter? I think it did to Daniel. And it's going to pave the way for his moving forward to have an incredible impact on a large group of people who really didn't even wish he existed when they first met him. He's going to change some lives, and so are you, if you can get this point down. So, believe what you believe. Have what opinions you have. Discern what your convictions are and hold tightly to those, but don't do so at the expense of your character. No matter what you believe, it's never good to treat people wrongly, to yell at, to disparage, to look down on. It's never good. It's never right. It's never honoring to God. So I want you to think about those two things as we're getting started and pray with me. Lord, this is a 2,600-year-old story whose central character is about 14 years old, 15 years old. And I ask with eyes and ears and hearts wide open that you would teach us something from his life, lessons that we could learn that would be valuable to put into practice in our own lives so that no matter what is going on, even if our worlds have been turned upside down and inside out and we are sitting in a heap of ruin, that we can find a way forward, that we can figure out what is our next step. Because as long as we have life and breath, we know that there is purpose for us in this place. And so I would ask that you would help us to find that 
and to live strongly according to that which you have convicted us is good and right and true, that we might be a blessing not only to those who believe what we believe, those who are part of the community of faith, but those who are on the outside of it, those who see things differently, that our actions may win favor and that we might see that even those who despise us the most cannot criticize anything about our nature because our convictions have held us and we have not responded in kind, but we have learned how to love even those who are the most difficult. And we have learned how to disagree without becoming disagreeable. It is challenging at best, but I ask that you would help us to do this as we move forward from this place today and in the days to come. In Christ we pray, amen. Please stand if you will. What we read and what you hear in this place is far easier philosophically to agree with than it is to live out. You will be challenged in many ways when you interact with people who see things differently and who are different. And I just want you to, as we're moving through this series, I want you to remember a young man who was held by convictions and was honored because he was an honorable young man. And think about the difference it might make in your life even with those who are difficult to deal with, if you respond not by trying to convert them to your way, but by listening, not judging, not filling in the blanks, not just trying to keep the peace, but actually seeking to make peace in the places where there is disagreement and disruption. I want you to think about that. It is difficult work, but you're up for the task. So I dismiss you now, which is the next place you go from here into the next places to really live out your faith and to make church happen. Be people of grace and peace. God bless you.